Uh, hello and welcome everyone to the Arthritis National Research Foundation's Researcher Spotlight webinar series. I'm Emily Boyd Storman, the CEO of the ANRF, and on behalf of our board of directors, our scientific advisory board and staff, I'd like to welcome you all to the spotlight on lupus. We're excited to have many of you joining us from all around the world and thank you so much for your support. I'd also like to welcome the moderator for our discussion, Dr. Michelle Kallenberg. Dr. Kallenberg is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at the University of Michigan. Dr. Kallenberg is not only a scholar, but she is a member of our ANRF Scientific Advisory Board as well. Thank you so much today for moderating our webinar. Before we get started, there are a couple of logistical pieces of information we wanna share. First, the webinar is being recorded and we'll have it available on our website and YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Second, if you have any questions during the presentations, please feel free to type them in the Q&A. If we aren't able to get to yours, please email info at curearthritis.org after the webinar with your question. Now let's get started with today's webinars and hear more from our ANRF scholars. Dr. Kallenberg, take it away. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everyone. I'm very excited to uh, moderate this session and hear talks from three outstanding researchers that have been funded by the ANRF. And I'm particularly excited because this webinar is focused on lupus, a topic near and dear to my clinical and research heart. Um, so our first speaker today is Sarah Baxter. Uh, she has her MD and PhD and is currently working as a pediatric rheumatologist and genetics researcher at the Seattle Children's Hospital at the University of Washington. And the title of her talk today is De Novo Mutations in Childhood Onset Lupus. Thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and can I get a thumbs up if that's showing? Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me and um, thrilled to have have the attendees. So, um, you know, uh, in finding that we we're going to also have um, some patients here, I wanted to open it up a little bit. I'm going to mention the de novo, but I also want to talk more generally about the genetics of childhood onset lupus. So if you guys have not seen this Venn diagram before, you will surely see it many, many times. This is how clinicians and researchers think about autoimmunity. There is no one cause for autoimmunity, just like there is no one presentation of lupus. Everybody's autoimmunity is a little bit unique, um, and there are often multiple drivers. So there are drivers of genetic, there are drivers that are genetic, there are environmental drivers, and then there's just the way that our immune system works and regulates. Many people have components of multiple of these, for instance, the genes and the environment, maybe also the immune system. I study childhood onset lupus, specifically with the idea that the genetic burden is higher in children. Children have had less exposure to environment. They've had less time for their immune systems to, to morph and adapt and change. And so we think that children who have lupus, a, a child who comes in at five years old, is much more likely to really have a strong driving genetic mutation leading to their disease. Um, one question that I often get though is, haven't we looked there? We've known about genes you know, for, for years. The first whole, whole genome was published a long time ago. Um, but this is one of my patients, he's now 21, but you can see he has multi-system autoimmunity. He had Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease when he was less than one. And then over the next 10 years, he developed kidney disease, type one diabetes, psoriasis, hives, arthritis, bone inflammation, eye inflammation. And as a rheumatologist, we treated him with immune modulators as best as we could. And we did look at him. We know that genetics are important and we looked at his genetics back in 2009 and they were reassuring. But Technology continues to advance as does our understanding. So this is a brief and incomplete list of the different ways that we can look at the genetic drivers of disease. We used to just have one way of sequencing. Now we have many ways of sequencing and each of those ways has its strengths and its weaknesses. Each of those ways ha have their blind spots. Um, and then you can look at, at the product. So, you know, when I think about DNA and RNA and protein and the way that we think about it, I think about our DNA as the cookbook, the cookbook that tells us who we are and, and to a certain extent we are, who we are going to be. 
But that DNA also then goes through, you know, sort of everybody's recipe catalog goes through little variations that maybe your mom told you. And then the end product, even following the same recipe can be a little bit different. And so it is vital that we look at that cookbook, that we look at that DNA, but that we also consider all of the ways that the DNA is then changed and un understood and interpreted on the way to making a protein. So this patient, for instance, we looked at, again, 10 years after his initial genetic testing that was reassuring, and we found that he did have a genetic diagnosis. He had a deficiency in a gene called FOXP3, which if had been discovered when he was younger, would have led to bone marrow transplant and probable cure of his autoimmunity. Um, unfortunately for, for this young man, um, we aren't able to sort of go back and do this, but you know, it is it is vital that we continue looking and we continue thinking as we learn these new technologies. So the reason that I'm looking at lupus and the reason that I'm so excited about genetic diagnoses in lupus is that current treatment is trial and error, essentially. And that's a little bit of an oversimplification. I would say it's a trial and error for an individual. We base our treatments on what we know works in the larger population, but we do not know what exactly will work for one given patient. And genetic diagnosis, as has been shown in immunology and cancer, is really a paradigm of precision medicine, where if we find out what is driving the disease, we can better decide what treatment to use to, to, um, to treat it. But in order to make genetic diagnoses routine in lupus management, we have to understand the genetics of lupus, which we don't yet. We need to understand which genes when mutated cause lupus, how a gene that's mutated in two people can lead to two different presentations of lupus, and then how to best treat those genetic diagnoses. So what I really do um, is gene discovery. I do gene discovery and characterization. So I start at a patient. I start at a patient and a child specifically with lupus. So for instance, for those of you who aren't as familiar looking at pedigrees, the circle down there at the bottom is the patient. And this was a young woman who was diagnosed with lupus at the age of 13. And the circle above is her mom, who also had lupus. And the circle above that is her grandmother, who had CNS lupus. And we can take families like this, and we can say, what genetics are shared between those three members of the family, that grandmother, that mother, and that child, in affected in, in those individuals? And then which of those genes of those many mutations look computationally like they might be damaging? and which, I apologize, um, and, and which make biologic sense, lie within the immune system. We can also look, um, and an even more powerful technique for gene discovery is looking at what are called de novo mutations. So if I have a child who comes in, such as this family, um, and the child has lupus and there's no family history of lupus or other related autoimmune diseases, I can say, what is different about this child? And we're taught that we get all of our genes from our parents, but in reality, small, small changes are made. And so up to one to two mutations within genes are unique to every individual and not from your parents. And then probably about 100 non-coding mutations. So mutations in DNA that don't lead to proteins are again, unique to a patient. And so it's a wonderful way to look at the huge, huge recipe book that is us and find that one page, that one gene that might be causing disease in a child and not their parents. And so for both of these families, for instance, I now have genetic candidates. Based on that computational candidate, which again, I look at the biology, I look at the, you know, in silico analysis, what does the computer say? And I look at the family, we then characterize it. So I take the genes, two different genes for each of those two families, and I put them into cell line models from primary cells. I take the patient's own cells and I look and I see how they do, you know, with various stimuli. Um, I look at how much RNA is expressed from each of those. So how is that DNA being transcribed? And then I look at the actual activity. And then on top of that, I learn more about the patient at the same time. I take that patient's entire immune system and I say, 
what exactly does their immune system look like? Is it is it skewed differently than other patients with lupus? Um, and I can do that by differentiation assays, by flow cytometry, by RNA-seq, and then by cytoff. Um, and um, if anybody in this webinar uh, happens to have questions about the, the two genetic candidates, um, this was a shorter talk, so I didn't have time to get into it, but I wanted to introduce how I find the genes and what I look like. Um, and every patient is a story. So I have over 250 children now with lupus who are in my study. And every single patient we look at in the context of their parents, in the context of their relative, whether I'm looking for inherited mutations or de novo mutations. And my ultimate goal is that every child with lupus receive a genetic diagnosis so that they can benefit from treatment aimed at their own unique biology. So thank you to the University of Washington and Seattle Children's Hospital, and really thank you to the ANRF for funding um, for this amazing work. And thank you to the patients and families for whom this research is done and for whom, you know, and, and to make this research possible. Thank you, Sarah. I think, Emily, you were going to ask questions that came through the chat in the yes, Q&A. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to chat them in. Um, you know, I have a question that came up, Sarah, about, uh, you know, how, how will we be able to address, hopefully in the future, those that don't have a genetic component to lupus? You know, will, will the goal be to have a genetic test earlier if they have some sort of signs or symptoms or something that can happen in utero? Like what, what is the ultimate kind of goal that we could aim to as a patient community? Oh, it's such a good question. And I think that, and I think that all of medicine is asking this, you know, as we have tools, how do we use them? Um, and I think that it's not going to be too far in the future when as a patient with a di new diagnosis, we will look for genes that we know. But then your question is good. What about those patients who we don't find a genetic diagnosis in? And one, we need to keep looking because our knowledge is incomplete. But the other thing that I think is that when we find a patient with lupus, where we have a genetic diagnosis, we then look at the rest of their immune system and understand better the drivers of their disease. And then we can work backwards and look at patients who don't have that genetic diagnosis, but whose cells and cell populations and all of those other assays look similar. And we can understand better how to subset those patients. And maybe those are patients that we treat similar to those who have a specific genetic disease. So I'm hopeful that my work will really inform, you know, treatment for, for both people with genetic diagnoses, but then also people who have stronger contributions or, or contributions from other cells. Fantastic. Yes, we have a little bit of time. I'll ask one uh, other question sort of related to that because we think in the adult lupus that it's really not just one gene that's going to be the answer, right? It's polygenetic. And so um, do you envision or think about like how we can sort of weight the genes that you find in kids um, to sort of create like risk scores when we find certain polymorphisms in adults that might, you know, have one part of a risk for disease, but maybe not as much as we think, like, how do you think, like, we'll learn about the genetic, the co more complex genetics in the adults uh, from, from these kids? Yeah, no, and I think, and I think that's a fantastic question. There's some amazing research being done on genetic polymorphisms. And, you know, I think one thing that you brought up is risk, you know, these, these genetic, even a genetic diagnosis is not necessarily fate, you know, mm -hmm. because people with the exact same gene end up looking different. And no gene is 100% penetrant, meaning no gene says that there's 100% chance you'll get it. Um, I think that a couple of things will, will happen with the polymorphisms. You know, as we figure out relative risk, we can tell parents the chance that their lupus will also show up in their kids. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll be able to take patients who have a positive ANA and joint pains, but don't yet have lupus, we'll be able to say, okay, we are worried that you might progress. Um, I think that, you know, fundamentally, if I were to, if I were to imagine my, my dream is to, is to take the diagnosis of lupus and, and not get rid of it, but find a way to subset it, find something that means something more than the general term of lupus, because that means something different to everybody else. And we've found 
that we can't just say, oh, you have kidney lupus. Oh, you have CNS lupus. People, people don't respond to treatments based on their organ systems. So I'm hoping that by better understanding the biology in children who have a little bit of a simpler story, we can find subsets of lupus patients, perhaps by the presence, maybe they have a lot of a certain type of B cells, or maybe they have a certain type of interferon for, and then we can use that information. And really what children with monogenic disorders provide is, is a cleaner, a cleaner example and a cleaner understanding to guide those because adults with lupus just have so many other contributing factors. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other thing that um, we can do as well is when we we understand those risk profiles better, is just educate on you know what what patients can do to help prevent. Right? We don't have perfect preventative, but you know smoking really amplifies the risk in people who have these risk factors. And you know diet and exercise and all of those things make a difference in terms of you know the stress that your immune system is under. And so, you know, it might help you know, make some path forward for people and give them hope, you know, that they can, can work to prevent things too. So all really important. And there, I mean, and there are some interesting studies, we're not doing them in children, but you know, they're interesting studies, for instance, in rheumatoid arthritis, which I'm, I'm sure somebody has talked about where, you know, what, what if you give Plaquenil, if you're really high risk and on the cusp of getting disease, but you haven't quite gotten that, that doctor's diagnosis, can we prevent? And we just haven't had the tools to even ask those questions. So Mm -hmm. if we're able to to better prognosticate, then an entire new therapeutic avenue opens up. Yeah, exactly. uh, Judy James is actually doing that study in lupus. I think we're supposed to have data next year. Um, So excited. So so great. It'll be really great to know (laughs) know about whether incomplete lupus can be uh, halted. It'll be very exciting. Any other questions on the chat, Emily? I know, I think we're good. Okay, Uh, Maria, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, Sarah, thank you very much for your excellent talk. Good luck with your research. Thank you. All right, so our next speaker is Maria Gutierrez Arcelis. Uh, She is an assistant professor at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And she will be talking today about alternative splicing in systemic lupus erythematosus. Great. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this webinar. And yes, today I'm going to talk about a process called alternative splicing. And I'm glad Sarah gave the first talk because she introduced really well the concept of a gene, how it gets transcribed into this pre-messenger RNA. And that, and then you, well, I guess I need to explain that you slice out the introns of the gene so you're kind of editing this recipe, like uh, what she was showing of the recipe giving uh, rise to pancakes. So there is a whole cellular machinery that kind of edits the copy of this recipe. And then through a process called alternative splicing, it's as though you would create two different recipes, maybe one for blueberry pancakes and the other one for uh, banana pancakes. So, so what is interesting is that from the same gene, you can get two different products or two different proteins that they might have different functions. And this uh, this type of uh, phenotype has been understudied in general because it's more complicated to analyze the data uh, to study this process in detail. Uh, but over 90% of human genes go through this alternative splicing process um, and also, it plays an important role in, in determining cell lineages. So depending on which isoforms you express, you could have, say, a B cell versus a dendritic cell, and each cell will have different functions in your immune system. It can also give rise to different cell states. So within a given immune cell, it can be in resting state or in an activated state, and this activated state can be different depending on which stimulus it received. So alternative splicing is also important for these processes. And uh, also it can be, you can find differences in alternative splicing between healthy controls and patients. And we are very interested in answering this question of how is alternative splicing disrupted in lupus patients? Uh, 
Um, so we are studying this particularly in B cells because B cells have been shown to be very important in the pathogenesis for lupus. B cells are a complex multifunctional type of cell of our immune system. They have the capacity to produce antibodies that are specific for particular pieces of, of pathogens. They have the capacity to present antigens. So they take a little piece of a pathogen and present it to T cells. Uh, to elicit an immune response. And they also have the capacity to respond to, to general bacterial and viral molecules. So it's a complex cell type. Um, and we know that certain B cell subsets are expanded in, in blood of lupus patients. Uh, from experiment in mice, people have shown that some of these subsets can be pathogenic in, in mice. And then we also know that for polygenic lupus, so when most of adult lupus is, is influenced by multiple genes across the genome, and these, these genetic susceptibility variants uh, are indicating that B cell genes are important and also regulatory elements that are active in B cells. So, so these are elements in the genome that are telling the gene how much to, to be expressed, how, how many copies of the recipe to, to produce. So uh, here I'm just showing you an example of differences in splicing between patients and controls from a, from a reanalysis of a public data set from Shara et al, 2019. So here I'm showing you these the exons of three exons of this gene. Uh, so the exons are the parts of the gene that will will code for the protein or that are creating the recipe. And typically we would just remove the in the cell will remove the introns. Uh, but also here, these links between this first exon and this third exon are indicating that uh, often you're skipping this middle exon. So here it indicates that in control, healthy controls, 71% of the links are, are skipping this exon. So the recipe would create a basically a recipe without the middle part. Uh, and in patients, this only occurs 21% of the time, and you can see enrichment of, of inclusion of this exon through this other link. So it means that the patients are more often including this exon. Um, so it means that probably they're creating a different version of this protein, and um, we don't know if, uh, what is tricky is that we don't know if this is a cause or consequence of the disease. Uh, but we want to find out. <laughs> so uh, here is just showing a table of all of the events that we are finding of differential alternative splicing between patients and controls in five different B cell subsets. And as you can see, we find um, these events in hundreds of genes. And this is what we're currently working on. We want to make sure uh, that the method, computational method we're using to analyze this data because it's a lot of data, we want to make sure that whatever method we use, we're finding consistent results. So this is called computational rep reproducibility. We also want to make sure uh, that there is replication in an independent cohort. So we're currently analyzing a different co cohort of uh, completely independent patients and controls to see which of these events are replicating in this independent cohort. And then that gives us a higher confidence of, okay, these events for sure are different between patients and controls. And then as I briefly mentioned, we are interested in, in determining uh, which of these splicing events can be a cause or consequence of the disease and which ones are the most uh, relevant to follow up to understand the mechanisms of the disease. And, and for that, uh, we're using a lot uh, genetics. So similar to, to what Sarah was mentioning, but in our case, we look at polygenic disease. So this means that, um, this means that uh, genome-wide association studies, these are studies that look at genetics. They, they have maybe 10,000 patients and 10,000 controls, and they look at which genetic variants are more frequent in the patients compared to the controls. And this these big studies have found hundreds of susceptibility variants that uh, predispose you a little bit, each one that predisposes you a little bit to lupus uh, because they're of small effects. And, and what was a surprise for a lot of researchers is that 
these variants are often falling outside of the genes. So if it was falling inside of, of a gene, it would be easier to know, okay, it's definitely affecting this gene and how and, and follow up and see how uh, how it's being affected. But because they're falling outside of the genes, we first need to figure out which gene are they targeting because this variant could affect this gene or this other gene. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I shouldn't get into too much detail, but we are very interested in, in identifying which of these susceptibility variants are affecting alternative splicing of nearby genes in B cells. And this will, if we integrate this with the differences between patients and controls, it will give us a clue as to what are the possible causal uh, mechanisms mediated through splicing that could be leading to the disease and triggering the disease. And hopefully this can help in the future to design uh, new therapies to treat or prevent disease. Uh, and so yeah, I would just like to end with the acknowledgements. Uh, I would like to thank my lab. We had recently like a Halloween day, so we wore funny hats. Uh, I would like to thank the Negrovich lab, uh, patients and healthy volunteers. And of course, ANRF for funding this research and uh, my institutions. And I'll take any questions. Thank you, Maria, for such a great talk. Um, uh, Emily, is there anything coming in on the chat? Uh, not yet, but uh, we'll give it a second. And then, of course, if any of the panelists have any questions, um, please feel free as well. So I have two, actually. Um, and these are kind of global concepts. So one, do you think that this alternative splicing is unique to lupus, mm -hmm. or is this something that you see in autoimmunity, or is this something that's in inflammation, or like, you know, how how unique do you think this particular issue is to lupus itself? Yeah, I think it's probably present in other diseases and in inflama inflammation contexts, uh, and we should definitely uh, do also research in these other diseases. Um, yeah, it's just been understudied because it's typically a little slightly more complicated to analyze the data. So people analyze like gene expression levels and and I mean, they also find really relevant results this way, but there's other layers of the data that we should look at and particularly for splicing since it can create very different protein products. I feel like we should pay more attention to it. For sure. And the other question I had, and the reason why I'm interested whether this is, if there's aspects of this that are unique to lupus is because the spliceosome, where, you know, the machinery that actually does the splicing, a lot of the things that come into that spliceosome are targets for autoantibodies, right? Like we, a lot of those mm -hmm. components of the spliceosome yeah. act as autoantigens. And so whether, uh, you know, if the cells are dying and that's, you know, if this is abnormally stimulated somehow, like, could that be a reason you know, why you see, you know, antibodies against some of the proteins that participate in this process. Just curious yeah. on your thoughts. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great point. We should think more deeply about this. Um, we do find that uh, for the differentially, differentially expressed genes in these B cell subsets between patients and controls, there's a lot of splicing factors. Mm. And then also in the differential splicing results, we are also seeing an enrichment for splicing factors. So the splicing factors get spliced themselves. So it is. it sounds like a very complex. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Does story, it have but... anything to do like in the B cells too? Because you get, I mean, splicing is really important for creating different autoantibodies and for, um, mm. you know, how the antibodies are made in the B cell. And so is there any interaction between the machinery that's, you know, doing VDJ recombination and, you know, kind of doing the mutagenesis and those types of things and, you know, splicing of other mRNAs? I, I don't know the biology well enough to, to yeah, know if they're linked. That's a great point. I will I will talk with my team to, to go deeply, more deeply into that. Uh, yeah, it's very cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Gutierrez, please feel free to chat them uh, or send them into the Q&A and we'll make sure to get those to her as well. All right.
Well, thank you, Dr. Gutierrez Arcelis, for an amazing talk and for doing some really groundbreaking research. And uh, the computations that go into this make my brain hurt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to know how many terabytes you burn through. It uh, also makes my brain hurt sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> trying to run all those algorithms. So I look forward to seeing uh, more of your data as it comes out. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, and our last speaker, ironically, if I were to walk out the door of my office and go 50 feet down the hall, I could come to his office. So uh, Dr. Uh, Jason Knight is a associate professor of internal medicine in the Department of Rheumatology uh, at the University of Michigan, same place where I am. And uh, he is an expert on antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and is going to be talking today on preventing blood clots in Queen Anne's lupus. Thanks, Michelle, for that very nice introduction. Do not come down the hall right now. That would be distracting. Um, and uh, thank you to the ANRF for inviting me to speak. I look back today, and I was funded by ANRF uh, from 2016 through 2018 when I was a youth, and it was a really uh, important time in my career, and the funding uh, made a big difference. I've now been doing this long enough that I have uh, some mentees that have been very fortunate to have uh, ANRF funding, and I think it's going to do the same for them that it uh, did for me. So uh, I can't say thank you enough. So we'll talk uh, about my favorite and most interested condition called antiphospholipid syndrome, or APS, which is, I'll tell you here in a second, is kind of a lupus uh, related condition that uh, I would argue is understudied and underfunded as well, you could say. Um, there have been, a, well, there's now a third attempt to give international consensus criteria to APS that is underway that uh, we're going to learn more about later this month. This is something we participated in uh, here at Michigan. But until that happens, we still rely on the 2006 criteria that were uh, developed in uh, Sydney, Australia. And this is uh, kind of what those look like. Um, so there are some lab tests with clunky names. And if we had more time, we could, uh, I could talk to you for 10 very interesting minutes about each of these and kind of how we uh, got here, but we'll save that for another day. Uh, these are lab tests that we may find in, you know, roughly a third of uh, patients with lupus. And, you know, not for everyone, uh, you know, has, as has been emphasized already there, you know, each person is different from the next, but, you know, on average, if you have these lab tests, it does suggest a more uh, severe course uh, with lupus. They can also occur uh, separate from lupus, and when that happens, we call the situation uh, primary APS. Um, I think uh, the clinical criteria, this is going to be diversified in the uh, new criteria that we'll see later uh, this year. Um, meaning that there are some other things that APS can clearly do that we will eventually be able to give uh, credit for in the new uh, criteria. But the two time-tested things that are inescapable are the risk of blood clots. And kind of uniquely, these blood clots can happen in arteries, such as uh, causing a stroke, or in veins, such as causing a DVT or pulmonary embolism, or in the tiny blood vessels as you would find uh, deep in the organs. So uh, kidneys are a common place that we see involvement there. And then the other thing that APS is well known for is pregnancy losses, um, especially ones that occur after the first trimester, which are uh, very uh, devastating for uh, the doctor certainly, but uh, more so the, the patient. So let's look at a case and we can look at a case going way back in time going back about 300 years. And you can actually argue United States of America would not exist in its current form without lupus and APS. Um, true with election season nearing, uh, maybe sometimes we feel like that would be uh, better if it was not exactly like it is. But let's assume we're happy with USA and we're kind of glad it exists. How did we get here and how did these diseases play a role? And so a timely topic that we need to think about is the line of succession of the British monarchy, which I'm definitely not an expert in, but I am interested in this kind of middle area. 
So from your history class, you may remember George III, who was king in 1776 when the colonists declared uh, their independence. He did not get along well with the colonists. And you can contrast him with uh, Queen Anne, uh, Anne Stewart, who was a queen from 1702 to 1714, who by all accounts was a great unifier. She brought peoples together, uh, for example, uh, you know, bringing England and uh, Scotland together under the uh, same uh, flag for the first time. But why this transition from Anne Stewart to her cousin, uh, George Hanover, who came over from uh, Germany to uh, take the crown? And so a major factor is that Anne's health was not good. Um, and so this is the reference that I took these notes from, but it has been described uh, in other places as well. So here is some description of some features the queen had. And so historians seem pretty solid that she had a diagnosis of lupus with things like butterfly rash and flares of uh, recurrent flares of arthritis, a tendency towards edema. But then some have also questioned if she might also have a diagnosis of APS. Uh, we certainly see seizure disorder more commonly in our patients with APS a tendency towards nosebleeds because the platelet levels get low. And uh, her reign actually ended in 1714 because she died of a, a stroke in her uh, late 40s. So a relatively young uh, woman who uh, succumbed to a lethal uh, stroke. But if that does not convince you, then we can look at her pregnancy history, which is uh, quite sad. Um, it seems at least uh, we know 17 times she was pregnant and uh, none of those uh, 17 pregnancies uh, resulted in an heir. Uh, uh, Mary and Anne Sophia, who were her second and third pregnancies, uh, both unfortunately died of uh, smallpox. But then after that, it was uh, stillbirth after stillbirth or uh, children who had a lot of complications from prematurity and did not live uh, very long. So, uh, you know, if she had had an heir, maybe this bringing this unifying qualities would have been uh, continued. And, um, you know, I would be talking to you uh, from Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, United Kingdom uh, today, and maybe our election season would look very different. So let me explain antiphospholipid in one slide. So we have a very clunky word there, phospholipid. So what the heck is this phospholipid? Um, so it is a type of a special, a specialized type of fatty molecule where it has this uh, head of the molecule that is actually water soluble. So this part agrees well with water, but then there's this tail region that is very fatty, so not water soluble. And the body has learned to assemble these phospholipids into structures that we call membranes. So you kind of get a waterproof seal that keeps uh, uh, and membranes uh, surround all of our cells. So that's what keeps the inside stuff of the cell inside and keeps the outside stuff uh, outside. So this is a phospholipid, but we call it antiphospholipid syndrome. And the anti comes from antibodies, which you have likely heard of. And if you had not heard of them before COVID, we've all heard too much about antibodies uh, since then. Antibodies, of course, are meant to protect us from infections. This is the good of antibodies, but in autoimmune diseases, uh, we can see antibodies that become confused and attack the self. And in the case of antiphospholipid syndrome, these antibodies are drawn to these uh, membrane surfaces where they do things such as damage or uh, in some cases activate uh, cells. So antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, is a syndrome of this uh, particular type of antibody. So I'll just tell you two very short stories that we have been working on. These are uh, stories we presented at last year's American College of Rheumatology uh, meeting, and uh, both are now close to being uh, papers. So hopefully you'll see them uh, you know, in the literature or even in the news uh, coming soon. So this first one has a fancy name, immunometabolism of neutrophils in APS. Um, the term to emphasize here is a neutrophil, which is a type of white blood cell designed to rapidly neutralize infections. Uh, 
They are a bit hard to study in the laboratory, and so we tend to know less about them than other types of white blood cells. It wasn't until 2004 in this fancy paper that a new thing about neutrophils was discovered, and that is their ability to release these structures that we call neutrophil extracellular traps, which uh, can be an acronym that we call NETS. And it's a useful acronym because NETS uh, kind of reminds us of what these structures look like. Uh, so the neutrophil can spew these net-like uh, webs out into the world. And these webs have uh, what we call antimicrobial proteins. So these are proteins that normally live inside the neutrophils that can be uh, damaging to bacteria or funguses or viruses that may be trying to attack the person. And the web itself, very interestingly, is built of DNA. So we heard about DNA in some different contexts today. Maybe DNA is the theme that can run through all of these talks. But here, very different. Instead of using it to code for something fancy, we're using it more for its structure. So this DNA had been super compacted in the nucleus, and now it becomes very relaxed and expanded and can be used to create uh, these webs that have DNA, other proteins from the nucleus, and these antimicrobial proteins. So uh, the first stories about nets were mostly good, such as nets protecting us from bacteria. We would all like that. But I told you the power these nets have. And so um, there can be a downsides to them as well. And that has now you know, largely what has defined this field over the last uh, 10 years or so. And here's some examples of some of the things that NETS can do from a scientific review article. But I would just point out a two that are very relevant to what we study in my uh, laboratory. A uh, vaso-occlusion is a fancy word meaning uh, locking of blood vessels such as by uh, clotting, so uh, blood clotting. And also a lot of the uh, molecules that end up in the NETS turn out to be good um, you know, we call autoantigens. They are, you know, proteins and other molecules that can confuse the immune system and cause the formation of autoantibodies. So multiple ways that these may be relevant to uh, rheumatology uh, patients. And, you know, we think especially uh, APS. Ah, so back to this story, now that I've hyped you on neutrophils and nets, um, you know, this is, you know, often as it happens, like these stories unfurl themselves over five and 10 years. And in the beginning, you may not realize where you're going. Uh, several years ago, around the time of the ANRF award, actually, um, we uh, did some gene profiling of neutrophils that we had isolated from the blood of APS patients. And we compared those to neutrophils isolated from people who did not have uh, APS. And you get a lot of uh, data out of this type of analysis that you have to find a way to simplify. And one way is to you know, put the genes that look different into groups to help you organize. And one of the groups of genes that stood out as one of the top hits was this one uh, surrounding metabolism. And so we had that knowledge for a while, but we have only recently gotten back to digging into it. And if you get a little more granular and look at some more specific pathways, you know, a number of pathways showed up that relate to the use of glucose by the cell. So glucose is sugar. This is an important source of energy for cells. And so we thought maybe something about APS neutrophils was leading them to use glucose uh, differently. And so we've been studying uh, the most classic way that cells use glucose, especially uh, neutrophils, as compared with other white blood cells is through this process called glycolysis. This is how a neutrophil turns uh, glucose into actual energy to power the cell. And you don't need to understand uh, the details here, but you know, if each of these dots represents an APS patient or a healthy person, we can see that there is a shift. Um, you know, in both cases, there is variability, but on balance, 
an APS neutrophil seems to be extra prime to utilize glycolysis. It can potentially get more out of a glucose molecule than a healthy neutrophil would. And we have uh, studied this in some um, mouse models of APS that we use. And we uh, model APS in mice by transferring antibodies from uh, the patients that we see in the clinic. And if we put these into the mice, it can make their blood too sticky and more prone to blood clotting, uh, just like we see in the uh, humans. And so uh, that makes it, we think, a good model. If we do that, but we also uh, feed the mice this compound called 2DG, which blocks glycolysis, we can essentially make that APS mouse look like a, a healthy control mouse. So each of these dots is a, a blood clot that happened in a different mouse. And you can see the ones that have received APS antibodies get much bigger clots. And we're able to reduce that by feeding them uh, 2DG. Uh, 2DG is probably not going to be a common treatment for human beings, but it makes you wonder if we could find the right dietary strategies, such as something like calorie restriction, if this could be a way to uh, reduce the activity of those APS neutrophils and thereby reduce blood clotting. And then one other uh, quick story to mention, uh, another project that was presented uh, last year that we are nearing uh, the point of uh, publishing um, is trying to use skin as a window inside APS. And I'll explain to you what I mean when I say that. And so in our patients with uh, APS, um, including those with, uh, with lupus plus APS, we can kind of see this particular change on their skin called levito. It's not exactly a rash, but it's a, a prominence of the super or the, the blood vessels near the skin surface. Um, and they become more prominent because the blood flow a little bit deeper down has become sluggish. So things have backed up and we can now see this pattern on the uh, skin surface. Um, even in healthy people, this can sometimes be triggered uh, you know, in the short term, such as if someone becomes cold, but in um, people with APS, it tends to be more uh, durable, like you kind of find it all of the time. And so an interesting observation um, from the clinic is that we know if people have this skin change, uh, they are at risk of having internal uh, problems, especially um, problems with the brain, such as stroke. So finding this on the skin predicts what is going on inside. Biopsying everyone's brain is not easy. No matter how much we uh, reimburse for that study, people are likely not signing up for that. But a easier thing to ask someone is if they would be willing to give us a skin biopsy. So we have kind of predicted whatever is going on with the blood vessels in the skin is likely to be a similar thing to what's going on with the blood vessels in the brain. Let's start with the skin uh, before we start putting needles into people's brains. And so we have used this technique uh, after doing a skin biopsy. This is a technique that Michelle is very expert in and actually her group has helped us uh, with this part of the project. And so, uh, you know, we can essentially see all the different individual cell types in that biopsy and understand what is happening with their uh, gene expression. If we tried to analyze them all together, we would lose a lot of that granularity. We could not tell what was being contributed by blood vessel cells versus what was being contributed by, you know, like keratinocytes, the kind of classic type of a skin cell. And so the cells we focused in on are ones called endothelial cells. And this is a, a fancy name for a cell that actually lines the blood vessels. You know, it's kind of remarkable because if you put like blood out on some random surface, such as this uh, desktop, uh, that blood will form a clot because that's what it's designed to do. That's what keeps us from bleeding out when we injure ourselves. But man, when it's flowing through uh, the blood vessel, it is not at all supposed to clot. So this endothelial cell surface is you know, very specialized for you know, not uh, overly triggering uh, the blood. And so, yeah, I'm just gonna show you some things at a very high level here, but 
this is kind of a fancy type of analysis that the uh, that the computational people can do for us, just showing us that the changes we see in APS endothelial cells, you know, they're not only there, but they have a lot of potential for communication with other types of cells in the skin. Some of those, such as the ones called smooth muscle cells, we think are uh, very important for how the blood vessel is functioning. And so we're kind of pursuing this hypothesis, and you can start out by doing this type of, um, uh, you know, high level information analysis that is good. But then, you know, we're trying to now go back and do the hard thing of trying to, you know, prove or disprove that these are really, really important uh, factors. And so, you know, we have this hypothesis that, you know, the antibodies are circulating in the blood, these endothelial cells are seeing the blood all the time. And this is, you know, the initial uh, problem in APS is that these endothelial cells get damaged and turned on. Not only do they change in their function, but then they send signals out into the world that change other types of cells. And we think this leads to uh, blood vessels changing in a negative way over time. And so the hope is that by understanding these pathways, we will think of new, smarter treatments, uh, short of giving like full blood thinners that can reduce the risk of a uh, blood clotting in uh, APS. So that is the only data I have to show you. Um, I will take questions when I can. We have a, a, a newsletter where we talk a lot about APS that comes out every couple months. Feel free to scan this QR code and sign up for that. We generate a lot of uh, original content that's uh, designed to be uh, given out to uh, patients and you know, I think we've enjoyed it as have people who have received it. That is what I have. Thanks for listening. And I would take any uh, questions. Thank you, Jason, for an awesome uh, talk. I believe your dog Sparky is part of the updates in the newsletter, right? Yeah, that's, uh, yes, my beagle Sparky, my daughter writes about him at the end of the newsletter, so people at least have to scroll through the sciency and educational parts to find out what's up with Sparky, a hound town, as we like to say, so very doggy dog, a very doggy dog. So the floor is open for questions. Emily, do we have anything in the chat? Yeah, so a question around, uh, I guess, the genetic component of APS. We we know that with lupus, you know, there there either could or could not be, you know, as, as evidence with Sarah's talk of a genetic genetic component. Do we know that for certain with APS, or does it vary um, just like other other parts of lupus do as well? Oh yeah, I think it's an area that there's a potential to uh, unlock new knowledge still. Um, you know, I think as we learned from the original talks, like to do the high level genetics, you need a lot of different patients to participate. And uh, we're involved right now in what's going to be the largest study of primary APS to try to understand its genetics, where, you know, here in Michigan, we've put about 150 uh, samples that are, you know, each of those was an individual who was willing to participate in our research that signed up for it. My hope is that by first going after primary APS, we uh, it's a little bit of a cleaner situation than when we have APS plus, APS plus lupus. So we'll see what we learn there, and then it should be possible to take that back to, you know, the data that are already have been generated for lupus and see what is common and what is uh, different. So, yeah, I think it's yeah it's exciting that we're going to make progress on that in just the next year or two. I think. Fantastic. I have a question on the flip side of that, Jason, from the work that you've done or your clinical practice. Have you found any differences between primary APS and APS associated with lupus in terms of outcomes, medication responses, um, you know, you know, where people get clots, new neutrophil behavior? Like what do we know about the differences? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, yeah, we probably understand APS in the context of lupus better because that's uh, 
a situation we've known about for longer, like that goes back to the 1980s. The reason rheumatologists are so involved in APS is because they first discovered it by studying uh, lupus patients in the 70s and into the 80s. Um, I think if we think of our very most challenging cases, they often are patients that have both diagnoses, kind of um, both doing bad things, but in different ways. And unfortunately, there's a real ability for them to sometimes, I think, uh, synergize with each other. And so, you know, if you could pick, I think uh, primary APS, the better scenario because it's a little uh, cleaner. The counter to that though is unlike lupus where we have a list of drugs to use and new treatments coming on board, you know, a lot. Uh, for APS, we haven't had a lot new in a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, we prescribe a lot of warfarin, also known as Coumadin, which has been around forever. Some newer blood thinners that are easier to take have come around. Um, drugs such as uh, Xarelto and Eliquis, uh, but it turns out these don't work as well for APS. So they're finally with some breakthroughs in the blood clotting field, but you know we've found that warfarin still works better. So um, yeah, definitely there's unmet. Uh, yeah, I mean there's tremendous unmet need in all of these diseases as we know. But you know I see it on the ground in APS all the time, and uh, you know warfarin also used as rat poison. That's how it was originally devised, and then kind of a uh, you know, refined and, you know, so it could be uh, given to the human and used for this property of blood thinning. But my God, um, I think I can do this for at least 20 more years. And by the end of that, I hope we have something better than warfarin at our disposal. And I'm pretty confident we will. Yeah, that's great. Um, any other questions, Emily? Anybody no else? Other, no other questions I think have come in, but of course we'll still take questions after the fact. Feel free to email us and we'll make sure to get those to the presenters as well. Okay, so are you closing us out? I am. I just want to thank all of you today for participating. A uh, special thank you to our presenters, to our moderator. Uh, all of these incredible presentations, I think, show the best, uh, the best quality of the scholars here, including our moderator, Dr. Callenberg. Uh, and we're so we're so grateful for all of the work that they're doing uh, as they work towards a quest for a cure for these diseases. I just want to thank all of you again for joining us. Uh, again, if you enjoyed this webinar, we kindly ask that you consider making a donation today by visiting curearthritis.org forward slash donate. Every contribution helps. Please remember to follow us on social media as well to stay connected. And thank you again uh, for everyone for your time today. <laughs>